Welcome to the virtual rebroadcast of PubK's 2024 Government Contracts Annual Review. During this week, we are presenting 14 panel discussions featuring more than 70 expert practitioners, as well as two in-depth conversations with key government officials. PubK publishes news and insights for the government contracts community, such as PubK protests and claims, PubK cybersecurity and data privacy, and PubK compliance and enforcement. In addition to our annual review, we also host webinars, podcasts, and in-person networking meetings during the year. If you'd like to learn more about PubK, visit us online at pubkgroup.com. All of this week's presentations were recorded live at our in-person conference in February at the Ronald Reagan International Trade Center. You can join any or all of these sessions during the week using the same link and password you use today. All attendees will be in listen-only mode. Your video will remain disabled through the entire session. Many of our panelists are joining us today to answer questions about their presentations. Enter your question into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and the panel will address as many as possible during the webinar. If time allows, we'll open up a live Q&A session after the video presentation. Our briefing book, which includes all of this week's slide presentations and other materials, are available for download from the PubK website. We are applying for continuing legal education CLE approval in Virginia, California, Texas, Florida, Colorado, and Kansas. While we cannot guarantee approval, we expect acceptance within the next few weeks. We will notify all attendees when those approvals have been received. If you received CLEs for our in-person event, you can apply for additional CLEs for panels that you may have missed. And finally, if you are interested in obtaining CLE, please look for our poll question during the presentation. The state boards require us to verify your participation during the event. The poll is a simple yes-no question. We will keep track of all responses to verify that you viewed the panel. If you do not wish to obtain CLE credit, you can disregard the poll. This conference would not have been possible without the strong support of our event sponsors, all of whom are listed on the next few slides. Our sponsors also provided speakers for our event and other valuable input. We encourage you to review the strengths and capabilities of these firms and to reach out to them directly with any questions you may have. And now we present our next panel, a conversation with Department of Defense Inspector General Robert Storch. Robert is a career prosecutor, a career government employee, public servant. Okay. That gives you some of his background, right? He was a prosecutor. So he's, he's done public corruption cases. He worked in the Northern District of New York, U.S. Attorney's Office, came to D.C. and was in the Public Integrity Unit here. Um, and then in the Middle District of Florida, uh, if you look at his Wikipedia page, he's privileged enough to have one of those, uh, you can see that every place he went, he became sort of part of the leadership of that office. In 2012, uh, he became part of the Inspector General community. And he can talk a little bit about what that means because it is a community. The Inspector Generals um, work together a lot. I like to think it's probably because the agencies don't want to talk to them, so they ha you have to have a friend, so you have the other IGs. Um, after being the principal deputy at the Department of Justice Inspector General and starting the whistleblower ombuds person program there, and actually for the whole IG community, I give you credit for that, um, he then became a Senate Confirmed Inspector General out at NSA. And you have the, the distinguished accomplishment, I don't know, the, the per honor of having been nominated by three presidents for Senate confirmation, both Presidents Obama and Trump. Uh, to become the NSAIG, and then more recently, President Biden uh, saw the wisdom in promoting Rob to the Department of Defense Inspector General's office. He was confirmed in November of 2022, so you have just a year under your belt, um, and you're still here. You're still smiling, <laughs> um, so it hasn't gone too horribly. Congress hasn't uh, fired him yet, as, as they are prone to do sometimes with inspectors general. Um, so how is it going? How are you finding the Department of Defense Inspector General's office and compared to your other accomplishments and the, the offices that you oversaw? Uh, 
it's great. I mean, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, it's an important opportunity to talk to folks that engage with our community a lot. And, you know, as, as you say, Lynn, and you know from your time uh, as the acting IG at, at DOD, that, um, uh, you know, I tell them I have my wife and kids to love me. Uh, but what I want is I want the department to respect the value of our work. Um, and so uh, I've enjoyed uh, all my stops uh, on the, in the IG uh, world. I think we're really privileged uh, to do important work on behalf of the American public, right? Um, so you have in any of these structures, and I've been honored to work at three different OIGs, as you mentioned, you have the departments and agencies we oversee, and they have all these um, different groups, and many of y'all deal with them on a regular basis. And then off to the side, you have the inspector general, right? And so we have basically two broadly writ functions. One is to do uh, programmatic oversight, so audits, evaluations, reviews, um, that look at different programs and operations of the departments we oversee um, and make findings and then recommendations uh, to help them to achieve their mission better, right? Um, and then separate from that, we do investigations. Um, and those can be internal investigations, administrative stuff, um, or uh, criminal investigations. In the case of DOD, we have the Defense Criminal Investigative Service, DCIS, I think folks know. We don't have a TV show like some, but we have a lot of great agents who do great work all around the world. Um, so between that sort of programmatic oversight, sort of on the front end, and then the investigative work on the back, back end, I think IGs across the community really play an important role in uh, ensuring the efficiency and the integrity of the operations of government. So if, if anyone is out there right now and can see their phones and is inclined to Google Robert Storch, Inspector General, yeah. one of the prompts you get is, who is the IG's boss? Right. So it's interesting <laughs> you said that. Let me make sure my phones are off. It's interesting you said that about Congress, because Congress can't actually fire me. Uh, the president, you serve as a PASIG, you serve um, at the pleasure of the president. And, and the way the statute works, um, the president... Um, should the president decide to do so, could dismiss an inspector general and is required to give notice to Congress with 30 days advance notice and to explain the reasons for doing that. And I think, um, fortunately, uh, the way our system has worked, um, uh, the IGs have been, you know, immune from uh, sort of the partisan type of stuff that would make our work difficult to do. Honestly, I tell my folks, and I've done it in all my uh, stops in the IG world, um, that we have to be completely nonpartisan and have the appearance of being completely nonpartisan. It's just critically important for the credibility um, and the authoritativeness of our work that people understand that. And you were kind enough to mention my own background. I, you know, purely through circumstances that have nothing to do with me or my merits, let me say quickly, I really have been honored to be nominated by three successive presidents of both parties. And um, hopefully that helps to reflect the sort of nonpartisan work that IGs do across the community. So you're nonpartisan, your office is nonpartisan, but you're asked to do work by the Secretary of Defense, by congressional committees, by members sure. of Congress. Um, how do you balance that? Yeah, it's a great question. So asked is the key word there. Congress can pass a law and require us to do work, um, and that happens every year, right? There are certain congressionally directed um, requirements that we have to, to do, FISMA being a famous one, but there are a lot of them that we do. Um, but the rest of it is up to us, and so we have a robust work planning process, as you might imagine, at a place as big as DOD, OIG, doing oversight over the whole vast Department of Defense. You've got 1,800 people, right? About, about 1,800 civilians. It's a small town. Some military, right? It, it's, uh, it's been an interesting journey for me in terms of leadership. I've never led anything that big, uh, but I have great people, and um, you, you, uh, I'm privileged to work with them. So, so any event, um, yeah, we do... Um, uh, oversight that's required by Congress, by law, and otherwise we get requests. And we may get them, as you say, from the department. We get them uh, from the Hill. We actually solicit input. One of the things is I want to hear from all these different constituencies, right? One of the things I do is I, I meet a lot with department leadership, with military leadership in commands around the world, and I want to hear from them about what the issues and concerns they have are. Then we bring all that back. We do our work planning process, and we try to identify the areas of greatest risk where our work can have the greatest impact on the programmatic side. Obviously, on the investigative side, whether it's administrative or criminal, it's more reactive. But even then, we're always looking for issues, and we may make recommendations that 
you know, we'll, we'll do an investigation, but out of that, we'll see recommendations or areas where the department can improve, so we'll make those as well. What I remember from my time there was in the morning when you'd get up and look at the newspaper, the clips, yeah. and see some DOD scandal or something yeah, right. had happened important in the world. You could almost guarantee that someone would be asking you to do a review of that or you would decide to do a review of that. Sure. So it feels very reactive as well to what's important that day. A absolutely correct, Lynn. And, and you know, one of the things um, is just trying to figure out how we use our resources to have the maximum impact. And we work at that all the time. So, for example, um, January 10th, I think you announced a, a look into an evaluation or a look into um, General Austin's hospitalization right. at DOD, because that was in the news. It was of interest to the public, to Congress, to everyone. So your office gets involved in that. Right, and we make an independent judgment as to whether there's value there to be added by doing an independent review on something like that, both in terms of what happened in that instance and then programmatically how the department is set up to address situations that might occur like that in the future. And so that's one of any number of ongoing uh, reviews like that. So when you look back at 2023 and there's your website is phenomenal in terms of listing all of the announcements and all of the audits and it's all the evaluations. There. Yeah, there's right. hundreds of documents on there to, to call yeah. through. Um, the unidentified, uh, uh, what we call it now, unidentified anomalous phenomena report. I exactly think if you're right. looking at ends of the spectrum, yeah. um, your office did that report as well, which uh, like a lot of the DOD audits, the result was DOD could be better coordinated and, and have a better approach. Yeah, I appreciate your mentioning it. You know, that's one of the ones where we uh, put out an a, uh, unclassified summary of the report. This is one of the things we started doing when I was up at NSA. Um, you know, I believe strongly in transparency. Um, I think it's one of the core values that uh, OIGs across the community advance through their work. Um, obviously, we want to do oversight that improves, as I say, the integrity and efficiency of the agency operations. Uh, but this, every bit of it's paid for with taxpayer dollars. It's the, it's the people's government, right? Um, and so obviously there's a lot of classified information out there that shouldn't be out there or that would do harm. That was certainly true when I was up at NSA. It's certainly true at DOD. Um, but a lot of it can be out there. And so one of the things I've worked with my folks on is trying to expand our efforts on transparency. When we do reports, in this case, there was an underlying classified uh, evaluation that we did of that program um, and so we obviously couldn't release that to the public but I talked to my team about whether it wasn't possible for us to do an unclassified summary to let the public know what they could about what we found in an area of you know substantial public interest and so whenever we do that sort of classified reporting we're always looking to see is there, some, is there an issue of substantial public interest? Not everything we do is. Exciting as my job is, some of it wouldn't be that interesting, maybe to the general public, but a lot of it is. And then the question is, can we put out something that helps to inform the public that is a fair um, account of our classified work? So we're able to do it in that um, instance and put out that summary, which I think helps to advance um, transparency. And we're looking at doing that with a number of other projects. One of the areas that you spent a lot of time on in 23, 2023 that I want to talk about, and then also how it dovetails into um, your office's interactions with contractors, is oversight of DOD spending in Ukraine. Right. Um, you have a history in Ukraine when you were at um, DOJ. You went, actually spent time there in the 90s? In the... It's, well, not quite, not, that, so not quite that far ago. So <laughs> it was a country. It's kind of, it was a country. It's sort of funny the way the world turns, yes. Um, so, um, as, I, as you mentioned, I, I still sort of consider myself a career prosecutor. I don't think you ever lose that. I spent 24 years. You're more uh, fair and balanced. Well, I, you know, I, I, you know <laughs> I, I'm very fortunate to get paid to do the right thing. I, mean, I always try to do that. And so, um, so any event, I spent, you know, two dozen years as a federal prosecutor. And DOJ has a program where they send people out around the world to help in capacity development in different areas. So I actually, with my wife, also a career prosecutor, uh, went out to Ukraine back 2007 to 2009, and we were resident legal advisors there, they call it, working on behalf of the Department of Justice in Ukraine, helping them to develop measures to address corruption. So it's sort of just interesting the way the world works, and years later, I'm back at, D um, I'm at DOD as the IG there, and as I think folks may know, one, one of the key parts of our, our mission is we um, are leading now as the Special Inspector General for Operation Atlantic Resolve, which includes the assistance to Ukraine, um, the oversight efforts over U.S. assistance, um, working very closely with our partners at state and USAID OIGs, and then a broader consortium of IGs across the community and other oversight entities 
GAO and others. So we're doing a ton of work in that area. I just was out there actually, uh, uh, not last week, but the week before, um, was out there for a few days, able to meet with folks, both U.S. personnel, also key uh, Ukrainian counterparts and leaders there, and then actually got to do some site visits where we went out to see some of the locations, including a hospital in an area that had actually been um, overrun by the Russians out in one of the western suburbs um, and saw, you know, how assistance was being used there. We went to a power plant um, where a big bomb about the size of this stage, maybe twice the size, dropped through um, mm -hmm. the roof and how that had taken out one of the generators and the work they were doing. And then from the DOD perspective, um, looking, perhaps most interestingly, went out to one of the sites where they do the end-use monitoring um, when the sensitive military equipment is provided over to Ukrainians and saw the way that's inventory, was able to speak with the U.S. and the Ukrainian folks of, about some of the issues they've, they've dealt with in that. So fascinating trip, uh, interesting to be back in these difficult times. So how does that spin off then into whether it's audit work or investigative work that involves defense contractors? Fantastic question. Yeah, so so we've, we've used, as we do with all our work, uh, uh, really a risk-based sort of approach to try to make sure that we're covering the waterfront in terms of the issues related to U.S. security assistance. So we do that on the front end with a robust set of audits and evaluations. I think we've released something like two dozen uh, reports so far during the last couple of years. Um, we have more than 30 ongoing and planned uh, review projects. And so we look at all sorts of issues, including issues relating to sourcing equipment um, and um, the <coughs> financial accountability for it and all the rest. Um, we also do fraud awareness briefings. DCIS uh, has people um, in the region, and now we have people at the embassy in Kyiv as well does fraud awareness briefing with contractors, talking about issues to be aware of, um, to look for that may reflect potential fraud or, or uh, other criminal conduct in connection with that assistance. And then on the back end, we have investigations. Obviously, I can't get into a lot of detail, but it's sort of the typical range of issues that we see in conflict uh, situations, including things like procurement fraud and pricing issues and stuff like that. So um, so I think our work in those situations around the world, long before I got to the office, um, has helped to, to inform that work. But contractors play a, a key role in that, obviously. Um, you know, all this security assistance, um, the stuff has to come from somewhere, right? Um, and so it's part of my job, my office's job to make sure that that part of the process works as well. So even outside of the Ukraine environment or the other contingency environments that, that we've had, um, DOD IG audits typically are of DOD IG programs. Correct. There are some contractor audits that are done, but um, they often involve contractors, even if you're looking at just a DOD program about um, how they're doing cost and pricing in a particular place. Uh, contracts are being looked at. If it's a look at sole source awards, contracts are being looked at. Sure. So some of the companies here um, are going to have their contracts audited if not directly, from the DOD perspective of doing oversight of how DOD is doing on that contract. Mm -hmm. um, in 2023, Congress in the NDAA passed, a, I think, a very little known provision. Uh -huh. And I want to make sure I don't get the numbers wrong, but it's, it's Section 5274 of the uh -huh. NDAA, which I think is pretty, pretty landmark and could have a big impact on the government contracting community because it requires, if an IG's office uses the name of a business in one of its report that that business get a chance to at least know about it, see it, comment on it. I mean, tell me how DODIG's implemented that and what do you think its purpose is and, and the impact it's going to have? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think you've given a fair description of the law, Section 5274 from last year's NDAA. And, and basically what it provides is if we name an NGO or a business entity in one of our reports, uh, they have a right, or y'all have a right perhaps, uh, to, um, to notice of that and to provide comments and then subject to the normal strictures about classification and other stuff, we'll attach those to the posted report. Um, and so I, you know, I, we've, we've implemented that I think um, very broadly and you know, I've told my folks, uh, and again, one of the things you learn in the big place is you try to give strategic direction and then you trust good people to carry it out and we have great people. 
Um, but I've said, look, that's Congress's determination. I think it's a, it's a fair thing to do. And so let's make sure we're doing it right. So we're not trying to, you know, it's a, the, you can look at the statute, it's pretty short. Um, there are different ways to interpret different things, but we're interpreting it liberally uh, to try to achieve the congressional um, intent. Um, so I, I will say, I don't think it's anything new. Um, at both of my stops in the IG world, and I don't know about your own experience, we used to do that sort of thing anyway. Mm -hmm. I've always thought it was fair. Um, and in fact, when I was the IG up at NSA, we did one of those unclassified reports, um, or summaries of a report. And the underlying report named a contractor, and the contractor didn't know about that. And obviously, it was classified. We weren't able to do that. So we took the name out um, because I didn't want to publicly name the contractor and impact them without them having an opportunity to respond. In other instances, back when I was uh, the deputy for Michael Horowitz, a truly gifted IG at Justice. Um, I recall we did work involving private contractors where we were able to give them a copy of the draft report shortly before it was released and give them an opportunity to provide comments that we provide. But even if you don't name the contractor, sometimes everybody knows. You can figure it out. Right, right, exactly. So you've got to be careful about that, right. Um, and so, I, again, I think that's something we're trying to implement in a way that's consistent with the congressional intent to, to give contractors that opportunity to respond. Um, and we could comment on that or not comment on that. Um, but what we'll do, and if you all look on our website, you'll see, um, that's my one southern word, y'all, uh, you'll see that um, we have reports where we've attached the response from a private entity that was named in one of our reports. And I assume you want to get it right. So if the contractor thinks something is wrong, they need to bring it to your attention. To try Absolute, to absolutely. And that's a great point, Lynn. I encourage folks to engage with our office early and often. Um, my whole job is to get it right, right? Um, as I say, I'm in a really privileged position, and my team is. We get paid to do oversight that helps to drive positive change at a really important place. We're not going to achieve that if we got it wrong. It's not really worth anything. Now, we're, we're not perfect. Um, our people work really hard to get it right, but we appreciate the input. So I encourage folks to do that on the front end so that those responses almost aren't even necessary. But having said that, we're going to comply with the law and make sure we're doing it in consistent with the spirit of it. Well, in that vein, let's talk a little bit about contractor disclosures. Sure. And Congress and its wisdom, the Defense Department, um, you know, the FAR, the DFARs require that contractors right. come forth with allegations of some, some of the criminal statutes related to fraud, Civil False Claims Act, significant overpayments, those kinds of things. Your office has a plethora of information on how you operate that program. Um, but how do you encourage contractors to come forward, whether and they have to in some circumstances because it's mandatory, but I think at least the clients that, that I've worked with, some of them are very hesitant to do that because they fear that that could be the death knell, just raising their hand. Yeah, no, as you say, in many cases it's required under the DFAR or the FAR or executive order, other things. But we really do encourage folks to come forward. We have, as you say, a lot of information on our website. Um, I don't know if it reaches plethora, but it's pretty it's good. A it's a lot. Um, so I encourage folks to look at that. If you look under programs, I think there's a drop down menu, um, and there's a section there on the contractor disclosure program. Um, so we do it. I mentioned the fraud awareness briefings that we conduct all around the country and around the world. So we really encourage folks to, to come forward. It, 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 it provides a convenient, I think, way for contractors to comply with those requirements and gives us an opportunity to get that information sort of on the front end and address it in a timely manner. I, I took a quick look, um, uh, and uh, our numbers have been going up in that area. Like to uh, the hundreds? Or yeah, yeah. We, a couple of, we had a couple of fiscal years where we were sort of in the 300s. Last year was in the 400s, and actually, if I recall correctly, in the first quarter of FY24, we had 125. So that if that extrapolates, you get to 500. So um, I don't know. We'll see what happens. But but showing um, uh, you know sort of robust numbers in terms of uh, disclosures, which is great to see. Um, a lot of them are in sort of the mischarging area. You won't be surprised to hear whether it's labor mischarging or for materiel or or whatever it is. That's a lot of it. I mean, that's where apparently some of the growth has been. My folks tell me. But um, yeah, it's a well-established program, and you know we uh, we appreciate come folks coming forward. We encourage folks to do that, and it's incumbent upon us then to treat them right when they do. So how do you guarantee that? Because a lot of these end up at the Department of Justice, right? Right. Well, you know, having spent most of my life as a prosecutor, I like to think we did the right thing um, there as well. There's no, 
you know, there are no promises in the sense that if you do this and you get this benefit or, or something like that. I, if I vaguely recall, um, and I haven't had a chance to go back and look at this, but my days as a prosecutor, companies do get a break under the federal sentencing guidelines when they voluntarily come forward um, with information. So that's always a good thing. That assumes corporate liability. I think in a lot of these cases, what happens is, as you know well, the contractors become aware of something that's been going on, mm -hmm. right? So I think it's very much in the contractor's interest to come forward and say, hey, look, we didn't know about this. This is what's going on. We want you to know about it so that we then can take the appropriate action to, to address it. The other way that um, contractors can come into the DOD is through the hotline. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something that I've had companies ask me about ever since I left the yeah. DODIG, which is we think a government employee is doing something wrong. Yeah, right. um, not just, it's not just sour grapes, it's not just that they lost the bid, it's that they lost the award, but they're performing on a contract, there's a government employee or leader who is violating the law, taking bribes from someone else, sharing procurement information with another contractor, the whole variety of types of, of misconduct. Um, and they ask me what they should do. They're afraid to come forward, they're afraid of being retaliated against a contracting officer, being seen as a complainer, and you know, that it's just going to get shuffled to management person's going to know they complained and, you know, it's not worth it. Right. And, and many of them just walk away. Um, others, I try to talk to them about the DODIG hotline and how that is an actual real resource. And I know you get tens of thousands of touches through the hotline, but that you also have a robust way of managing and sort of taking those in. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Happy to do that. And I appreciate your uh, encouraging your folks. And I encourage everybody, if you all become aware of even you're not sure if something's right or not, um, to err on the side of caution and report that. We do have a hotline. Um, again, you can access it through our, our website. Um, provides a really easy, sort of convenient way to bring that information forward. Uh, you were kind enough to mention my background at DOJ, um, where I was able under IG Horowitz to to really start our whistleblower, we called it ombuds program now, now they're whistleblower coordinators. It's really critical for OIGs that people come forward when they see something they think is wrong um, so that we have a chance to look into it and take any appropriate action. And that's, that's really true in a place like the Department of Defense, which is you know so vast, there's so much going on. We try through various means to find out, but really we depend upon people coming forward to let us know. So the hotline's a really easy way to do that. As you say, we have a very, robust sort of process that things get reviewed. Um, we work very closely with all the different oversight entities across the DOD. Well, let's, let's explain yeah. how that would happen yeah, if sure. someone has a concern about something that's happening on an Army contract or a DLA contract. Those places have IGs as well. Sure. Um, should they go there or should they come to the DOD IG? Yeah, both are fine. There's, there's not, I, either one's fine. The important thing for me is that you report it. We coordinate. Uh, closely with our colleagues, you know, across the... So are you the boss of those IGs? Not, not exactly. <laughs> I mean, they, they all report within their own structures, um, and, and I respect that, um, but we have really close relationships. And then, as, as you may recall, I head up something called the Defense uh, Council on Integrity and Efficiency, the DCIE, uh, which is sort of a consortium of all these entities um, and an opportunity for us to exchange information. And I'm trying to work with them to make that more of an operational sort of exchange as well. But to your question, um, we coordinate very closely with them. So if we get something over the hotline, and it's really not for us, because you mentioned we're a big IG. I think we're by far the biggest in the IG community. But compared to the department we oversee, right, with millions of people and half the discretionary spending in the United States or whatever it is, um, we're not so big, right? And so we depend upon that whole umbrella of defense enterprises. So a lot of times we'll refer things out to one of the other OIGs, say the DLA one or whichever one you want to pick, um, to, to look into. Um, sometimes they'll refer stuff to us, particularly things involving the higher level uh, personnel that we might handle. So something that comes into the hotline can be spun out to another IG. It could go to DCIS and become a criminal investigation. It could be a significant program issue that becomes an audit. Is that Abs absolutely. Okay. We, that's a great point. One of the things we do is we scour those hotline complaints to see are there systemic issues 
that we should be addressing through our audits and evaluations. Um, and they're not mutually exclusive, right? It could, you could have both. You could have misconduct that needs to be addressed from an administrative point of view. None of these folks work for me, right? We, we do the investigation, then we refer it to the department. If we substantiate misconduct, it's up to the department to decide what to do with the people. They don't work, work for me. But having said that, um, we can do the investigation, but we can also find issues that will provide the audit that may lead to an audit now or when there's sort of enough of them, there's sort of a, um, there, there's a gravity to it that we need to look into. You mentioned um, your role at DOJ on uh, whistleblower reprisal coordinators. Yeah, right. Um, and every IG has one so that people in the department or contractors who think they've been retaliated against can call. So your employees might be calling the DOJ IG whistleblower um, coordinator to get advice on the processes they could follow. Absolutely. It's critically, I have a sort of a mantra on this that I've had since my days at Justice through NSA and here, and I'll tell you what it is. It's people perform a valuable service when they come forward, when they see something they think is wrong, they should never suffer reprisal for doing so. The reality is they're not going to come forward if they suffer reprisal. People are going to hear about that. Um, and more importantly, it's just the right thing to do when people right thing and come forward, they should be treated right. So we do have, they're now called whistleblower coordinators. I have a great one in my office, all the IGs have them. Um, and they exist for the purpose, those positions, of ensuring that people know about their rights and protections. So if there are questions out there about what happens if I come forward, what's the protection, that sort of thing, really do encourage folks to reach out. The contact information is on, once again, our website, um, but encourage folks to reach out to get but that when these, when employees of contractors do go to your office because they feel they've been reprised against, um, it can be investigated. There's, it looks like there's hundreds that come in and very few get investigated. And I think it, you've started something since I've been there, an ADR program. Right. And so contractors might be contacted by the IG's office if an employee is filed to engage in ADR. Can you talk about that program and why it's important to you? Yeah, thanks for mentioning it, Lynn. I think it's a great program. So oftentimes we find that the delta between the individual um, who's, who suffered the alleged reprisal and the contractor, the department, whatever it is, is not that broad, right? And so many times we can um, bring them together. We do it with an independent person who wouldn't be involved in any subsequent but they're from your investigation. Office. Correct. Yeah. But someone who's not involved in any investigation that would occur. We have a separate group of people who will mediate essentially. Um, and many times we're able to reach a resolution that sort of works for everybody. And that's a much more efficient way to do it, obviously, than going through the whole investigation. As you say, we, we, we're committed to doing them when appropriate. I personally still review every one of them. It's something I committed to do back every, in the day. Not every complaint. No, not every complaint. I can't do that. <laughs> I can't do that at DOD. But every whistleblower reprisal uh, report, um, I review those to make sure that I'm not, not with a goal of what a particular result is, but to make sure that I'm satisfied based on my own experience in the area that we're doing everything we should have done to reach the right result. Um, and so I think that's a great thing. Something else we've put in place since I've been there that I brought with me from my prior stops um, that I think is working great um, is when there's an allegation of reprisal and we don't substantiate it. Um, we, we look at it and we say, no. Nope, I mean, we'll most find of them are not substantiated. Well, that's fair, right? But we look at it factually. We, you know, I always say we try to hit it right down the fairway. I can't do that in golf, but we tried to do it in an oversight. And so if we don't substantiate, we'll give the individual who came forward with the claim of reprisal an opportunity to review our tentative conclusions and the basis for it and give us any input they have on it. Um, and I think that's a really fair thing to do. We, as I say, we try to get it right. We've got great people, but some of this is really complex, as you all all know. So we want to make sure we've gotten it right. And also, I think it's important that people understand that we mean what we say when we talk about institutional justice and treating people right. So I actually, back in my days at NSA, where we brought the same um, process, I had, we had a couple people come forward and say, you know, I don't think you, did, you got it right, but I really appreciate the way you handled it. And that, that's gold out there. Then people know that word gets around, that we're treating them right. Conversely, if you don't treat people right, that gets around as well. But, but I'm committed that we treat people right. So you want to hear if, if, if your office is failing at that? I want to answer. Oh, we're, you know, we're all about improvement, right? That's what we do for a living is we do stuff, whether it's programmatic or investigative, to help the department improve. So if folks have suggestions on how we can improve, I'm 
ready and eager to hear them. Well, we didn't get to some of the areas where these people interact with your office, in particular subpoenas and those yeah. kinds of things, but maybe we'll have you back for an additional PubK sure. event um, and, and be able to talk about some more of those things. So I appreciate you having time for the conversation in between some of the uh, intense government contracting right. legal topics that we're discussing. So thank you so much, Rob. Really important. Thank you all. Thank appreciate you. your attention. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you to our panelists for their presentations. And again, special thanks to our sponsors whose support made this event possible.